you. All right, so Wendy and I uh, co-led the session with a breakout five and our, uh, what's that? Our overall goal was to uh, come up with ideas on how to determine the functional consequences of variants, both individually as well as in combination and ultimately all variants in the human genome. And we had uh, lively discussions on what type of experimental systems would um, best be utilized, uh, the types of experimental as well as computational approaches. <coughs> and uh, more limited conversation, but we did attempt to uh, discuss how to solve the problem that this experimental space is so potentially large. And so uh, Wendy's gonna go through what our actual comments were. Perfect, very good. Okay, so um, thanks to everyone in the working group. Uh, we've summarized the big ideas here. Um, so you've heard some overlap actually between working groups four and five, perhaps not surprising. Uh, the first is to do really a very large study in terms of thinking about um, being able to do a single cell GTEC, but on large numbers of individuals. Uh, so with being able to do this, a large number of individuals, long reads in terms of the DNA, long reads in terms of the transcripts to be able to see all the alternative uh, splice variants, uh, and if possible, to be able to, on single cells, be able to see multidimensional data. So in other words, in terms of being able to get from a same single cell, a taxic data, a transcriptome data, even perhaps metabolome data. Um, as we're doing this and thinking about doing this, it's important to be able to get a diversity in individuals. Uh, by that we meant uh, from a developmental point of view as well, so it's not just all adults in this. In fact, this would include to a certain extent fetal embryonic development. Some of those same uh, genes in terms of gene regulation are also what are done with tissue repair, so those same genes can be relevant not only in fetal development but later on in life. Um, some diversity in terms of thinking about different disease states, uh, population diversity as we've heard throughout the meeting. Um, but as we do this, realizing that we can't take every single cell from all of, say, 400 individuals, uh, we also need to think about accessible tissues so that as you do this on scale, understanding, for instance, if you could get blood or fibroblast or some other accessible tissue, to what extent this would represent the diversity that we see across other cell types. Um, as we're doing this, to be able to put this together and have some cases where we can then start taking these data sets and also then do predictive modeling, so taking data in some cases with a deep dive, but then be able to scale it and be able to build the computational models, uh, the algorithms that are necessary then to do prediction in the future. Um, and with this, as we get into disease-specific areas, there are opportunities for NHGRI to now collaborate with other institutes uh, to be able to make this very disease-specific and focused in certain cases. Um, one of the big, I think, uh, things that everyone in the group agreed upon is the need to be able to put data together, to aggregate data that's multidimensional, that's coming from different places, and make it very accessible and very user-friendly. Um, so with this, uh, in terms of being able to do this, this is, for instance, taking, uh, to a certain extent, nomad data, population allele frequencies, ClinVar data, with as much as we can get it, deep clinical phenotypes, as well as model organism data, and being able to really put that together and tie that together at the gene level and uh, even higher dimensions if possible. Um, that would then be an enabler to develop some of the new statistical models that we're doing, but it is not trivial to do because being able to harmonize these data sets will in fact require quite a bit of work in terms of controlling for things like batch effects and others, uh, but hopefully this will enable many more users to, to consume the data in a useful way. Um, as we talked about doing this, there were some uh, uh, being some um, methods that can be developed. This is along the lines of NOMAD, but being able to do this even further uh, now that we've got whole genome sequencing to think about constraints really genome-wide um, to include regulatory regions and having more phenotypic data to go with that obviously is going to be better. Um, as we thought about this, we thought about some dimensions that include, for instance, RNA structure um, and being able to even look at that level of resolution um, and being able to make some correlations as we have some of the first project, correlations between RNA abundance, protein abundance, being able to get tighter correlations with that, uh, with even where, uh, from a tissue point of view, which cells we're expressing it, and even subcellularly, which components or which uh, subcellular locations the proteins are located. 
In thinking about the longer term, we realize that there are some gaps in the technology, and to the extent that we can have some tools, some additional tools, those tools will be enablers for the longer term. Uh, one of the things we realize is in able to, we've been able to uh, read and edit, but in terms of thinking about now writing the genome, we need to be able to make much larger pieces of DNA with much greater fidelity. Um, so in other words, uh, larger, faster, cheaper, better as we go forward, and that would enable a new set of experiments to be done. Uh, as we do this, again, cheaper, faster, better, longer read sequencing, both at the DNA and RNA level, and realizing those may not be the same technologies, uh, and as I was alluding to before, being able to do multi-omics even from a single cell if possible. So I'll stop there, and if any members of our group had things that we didn't represent that were important to represent, we'll be glad to take those comments.